Hey everybody, what's going on? I'm Andy, I'm a self-taught software developer, and in today's video, I'm gonna give you seven tips that you can start using right now to make your code better. Just to be clear, these tips are from clean coding principles, and they're really meant for people who are just starting out, so people who are beginners. If you're intermediate or advanced, these may be helpful for you, maybe, they just might, but they're really meant for people who are just starting out. Now, for people who are just starting out, just to give you an idea of what clean coding means, the, the very basics, how could I, I could explain it in like two or three sentences, is that basically code should be readable. Uh, you wanna increase the signal to noise ratio in your code, so you wanna make sure that there's not a lot of excess a lot of distraction in there, and that's what we're gonna base uh, all of our tips on today. So let's just dive into it. So number one, you need to avoid abbreviating your variables. So we have a good example here. We have uh, three variables that are declared, and it's not super clear what they are. Maybe whoever was using this thought that, hey, if I, re if I abbreviate the word password to PWD and users to users, that everyone else is gonna understand exactly what I meant when I was coding this, but that's just not true. Even if you know what you're doing, two weeks later, you're going to forget what your intention was here and you can come back and be a little bit confused. Abbreviating variables can be appropriate, but they have to be universally recognized. So I only really recommend using abbreviations for things like URL, HTTP, things that are widely recognized. More than that though, if we go to use these abbreviated variables, look like this is a for loop. Trying to read through this, it's a little bit disjointed because you're going to have to stop and try to process some of the variable names. Um, it can lead you to taking a little bit more time than is necessary, and that adds up in a large code base. So instead, what we should do is just descriptively na name our variables. So in this case, we have email address, password, and user. And then if we use that in the same exact context as we were using before with the abbreviated variables, you can see that it's easier to read. Okay, we're looping through a bunch of users, if the user's email address matches the email address and the user's any of the user's password equals the password, if we get those two conditions to ma match, then we are going to log the user into the system. That's pretty, I think that's pretty straightforward and that makes sense. So don't abbreviate your variables, just descriptively name them. The second concept that you really wanna get down is function arguments. So you don't wanna have really longer than three function arguments. So let's look at an example here and you see a function that has what is that? Six arguments, that's way too many. Just looking at this here, this function that's declared, it's like there's just there's a lot you have to go through. And if you see when this function is actually called later on in the code, you can see that we have to pass in a bunch of strings. If your code editor is this big, it's gonna go all the way to the end of the screen. It might get cut off depending on how many arguments you have. But not only that, like I see here where the function's called, you have an, uh, one of the arguments is called uh, active. Right, that's uh, okay, so if I didn't know this code, if I was just coming to this the first time, how do I know that this fourth argument, what active even means? I'd have to either hover over it and hope that the, the intelligence sense will tell me what the argument name is or the parameter name is, um, or I just have to go back to the function and see. What's even better is just to create a function, like this, in this case, this is JavaScript, that just takes one argument, that's a user. And when you actually go to call this function, you're going to new up a new object that's going to have all of those parameter names inside of the object properties. So you can see I have a username, password, email address, status, IP address, etc. This is very clear what's going on because now when the function is called, I just look above it and I can see what the user IP address is, what the user status is. There's no ambiguity there, it's just much more clear. So I highly recommend keeping arguments to three or less and using strategies like this to lower your the number of arguments that you're gonna use. The next one is my personal favorite for people who are just starting out. It's simplifying your conditional expressions. So let's just look at an example to make this dead simple. So this happens a lot with people who are just starting out. So they love going through if else statements because when you learn if else statements, it's just like you wanna use it all over the place. It looks so fun and cool. It's so much, so programming, right? But um, in this case, like, we created a function, can person drink alcohol, we pass in a person, and it makes sense here. If the person's less than 21 years old, we wanna return false, uh, otherwise we wanna return true. This, is, this makes perfect sense. This is a great function, it's modularized, it's very clean that you know, we took some logic from somewhere else and moved it in a well-named function. But here's the thing, we can make this code a lot simpler. If we just return the conditional expression directly, so if we say person age 
is greater than or equal to 21, then we've done the same exact thing without using what, six lines of code? Now you think to yourself, well, it's just six lines of code. Well, if we can just do this all over the place in our code base, if we have if else is all over the place and return one line, your code base is gonna be a lot easier to read, a lot more pleasant to work with. And you know, if you have a really complex code base, this sort of thing adds up. So anytime you can ret return conditionals uh, directly, you're gonna wanna do it. The fourth tip that you also wanna take to heart is declaring variables close to their usage. So I actually found my Tetris game that I uh, created a long time ago. At this point it was what, it had to be five years ago. And uh, you see that there are a lot of de variables declared at the top of our file here. Now my file I think is anywhere from like five to 600 lines long. This is just a quick sample of it, but I declared so many variables at the top and then started using them all the way down. And this is not a good strategy because if you are debugging your application or even just working on some functionality somewhere you know, deep down in your file and you have, or you're, you're, you're using variables that are declared way up at the top, well, that's just gonna be very frustrating because in this case, I've named the variables completely terribly. I've abbreviated, like I said, not to do, but you're gonna have to jump around and constantly look for the context where that variable was declared and it's just gonna cause you a, to lose track, lose focus. And again, your brain, you have to think about your brain. Like you wanna lighten the load on your brain. The like, coding can be very difficult as it is trying to manage complexity. So reduce complexity by declaring variables close to where they're used and that will avoid a lot of the problems of trying to deal with some headaches that can come with that. The fifth tip that is kind of a sneaky problem for a lot of people is making sure that your functions do what they say and you want to avoid unintended consequences. So let's look at an example. It's probably easiest to understand. So we have a function here called add numbers and you, it, that the function takes two arguments, the first number and the second number. Now, if you have a function called add numbers, you're going to expect that that function is probably going to add those two numbers together and maybe return it. But in this case, we're sending an email. That doesn't make any sense. Maybe there's a use case for that. But look, if you have a function named add numbers, this email being sent out doesn't make sense. Um, they're, they're not logically, uh, they don't logically make sense. That's not an abstraction that makes sense. So that's what I would consider an unintended consequence. If you want a function that adds two numbers, just add two numbers. As you can see here, this looks a lot better. Another good example here is append string. Like if you have a function called append string that takes two strings, you're assuming that you're gonna append those two strings together. You're gonna put them together. But in this case, whoever created it decided that it would make sense for them to add some white space in between the first string and the second string. But truthfully, that's not really an intended consequence because if you have a function named append string, I'm gonna assume that you're just putting those babies together. That's what I would expect from my years of programming. And while, yeah, you could argue that, yeah, maybe the, if you're gonna append two strings together, they should have a space, that should be clear from the function name. So either change the function name to say something like append string with white space in between, uh, or just change it to this and just change it to no white space in the middle, just uh, keep the function name as it's gonna be. So we wanna make sure that if you write a function and its name says it's doing one thing, then it should do that thing. The sixth tip that I'm gonna give you is making sure that your functions do one thing and one thing only, they do it really well, and avoid long functions. So when you have functions that are 25, 50, 75, 100 lines, I've seen a thousand line functions, that's when problems just start to pile up because first of all, that function is not doing one thing, it's doing a few things. It's not doing one thing very well, it's doing a couple things very poorly. And, and when you go into a function that is very long, you're going to have to start managing complexity, as I said before. So your brain, in order to like try to manage everything that's going on in that function, will have to keep things in its you know short-term memory. And you're gonna to have to just store so many things in your short-term memory that you're not gonna be able to manage all of the things that are going on. So I just created a function here that I think you might see in some code bases. And look, it's actually not that terribly long, but just if you look through the function here, there's a few things going on that don't necessarily make sense that are unintended and maybe could be shortened and abstracted into another function. You have database going on, you have uh, values being inserted into a database, you have emails being sent out. So something like this, just looking at it, is hard to kind of parse through. There's just a lot going on. This could easily be refactored and simplified so that the code is more readable, so that when you have a create user function, it should just be pretty simple what's going on here. There should be nothing, you're, you should be distracted by random things that are going on, and you should be, it should be able to flow through the function very easily. So number one thing is avoid long functions. Make sure that when you write a function, it does one thing, and it does it really well. That's really good modularization. It's very clean code-ish that's a word, and uh, you're gonna wanna follow that. And the seventh tip is my absolute favorite. You're going to wanna avoid 
Zombie code, okay? So zombie code is code that is currently dead but could come alive uh, if somebody decided to uncomment it. So you can see here, this would be an example of someone leaving zombie code in your code base. Zombie code is typically left by developers who wanted to leave a little snippet of code where they were working because they couldn't trust that that code uh, could be deleted, right? So they were working with something and they're like, yeah, I'm just gonna comment this code out because I may come back and use it later. But what's really scary is this code could come back to life and cause really bad harm to your code base. It could, it could uh, introduce bugs, sneaky little bugs. What's even worse is this is very distracting. So we said before you wanna have a high signal to noise ratio. Well, commented code is distracting because somebody's gonna stop and they're gonna read it. So it causes the reader to slow down. So the reader's gonna say to themselves also, like, is this something I should implement? Should I uncomment it? Should I put it in here? Really what zombie code comes down to is you should never put this into production, obviously. Like you should never put this into your portfolio applications. Make sure you remove it. To me, it looks like bad form. Uh, if you really wanna leave zombie code in, what you should really do is use source control. So use Git to save your code um, or any code that you're afraid to delete for later on when you actually wanna use it. So use source code appropriately, avoid zombie code, and you uh, will have code that's looking better and reading e more easily. All right, so those are my seven tips that you can use right now to write better code. I hope you enjoyed the video. Go ahead and leave a like if you enjoyed it and subscribe to get more content anytime I put out new videos. Make sure to hit the bell icon. And just to let you know, I just recently put out a PDF report on the top five programming languages to learn in 2019. It's a really good report. I spent a lot of time on it. I think you're really gonna enjoy that. So go ahead and download that at andysterkwoods.com forward slash report. Uh, other than that, that's really all I got for today. So thank you so much for watching and peace out guys.